Hello and welcome everyone to a new construction materials lecture. Today we'll be talking about steel. So the learning outcomes for today. We'll be discussing steel frames, what they are and the different components that make up steel frames. We'll be talking about hot rolled and cold formed steel and the distinction between these two steel types. We'll also be discussing some important properties of steel. And finally, we, I'll be showing you how steel frames are designed in reality. Our first station for this week is where I'll be talking about steel frames. So I'll describe some of the main components that are involved in a typical steel frame structure. So in that picture that you see in front of you, the major components making up the steel frame are highlighted in yellow. Let's start off with the beam. So the beam is your horizontal steel elements. Your vertical steel elements are labeled as columns. And then we have diagonal elements that are usually placed on the outside face of the building. And these are referred to as bracings. Now these bracings are important because they resist your horizontal forces, i.e. your wind loads and any earthquake loads that are imposed on the building. So these three components that you see are basically what comprise a typical steel frame. When you're constructing your steel structure, there are two types of connections that you can adopt. The first connection is a bolted connection, and that's where you have these bolts connecting your beam onto the column. The second type of connection is a welded connection, and you can see the welds over here highlighted. Now, what we also notice is that for the welded connection, we have these bolts put in place. And these are just used to make installation easier. So it's just to um, roughly hold uh, the, the beam onto the column while the welding takes place. In station two of this week's lecture, I'll be talking about hot rolled steel. We'll be discussing the main production system involved in hot rolled steel and what are some of the properties that are associated with hot rolled steel elements. So if we start talking about hot rolled steel now, this is the most common type that you see in buildings. And it's basically steel that's formed due to rolling your steel, your different steel elements at very high temperatures and we're talking about approximately um, 1500 degrees Celsius so temperatures that are over 1000 degrees Celsius. Uh, the reason that uh, such temperatures are chosen is because above such temperature your steel melts. Um, it's above the steel's recrystallization temperature um, and hence it can easily be molded into different shapes and different um, sections. Now some of the examples of the uh, most common hot rolled steel sections you see in front of you over here. Um, and this is remember this is a cross section view so what the diagrams that you see are you can think of it as a section that goes into the page. Um, so if we start off with um, the equal angles now these are usually typically used um, for your corners. So if you've got, you know, a corner beam, say for instance, you'd probably use you know, like an equal beam, um, an equal angle, sorry, uh, an equal angle, same purposes as well. The only difference is that the vertical member is longer than the um, horizontal one. Um, Plates are also used, so and these are typically bolted or welded to your various uh, beams and uh, columns within your steel structure. 
we also have our universal beams and these are very important and very common um, and they basically look like an i-shaped uh, they have an i-shaped cross-section uh, universal columns again i-shaped uh, the only difference compared to the UB is that for a UC for the universal column it's a bit uh, bigger so wider flanges as you can see and um, the web is almost the same so within these sections the horizontal um, the horizontal elements are referred to as flanges and your vertical elements so these ones are referred to as your webs and then finally you have your pfc your parallel fan channels and these are typically used as columns so um as i said these are just some of the common or the most common steel sections that you find in steel frame projects now stations me moving on to cold formed steel so we've already discussed what hot rolled steel was cold formed steel is another steel type that's um, used in the industry and the difference now is that you form your steel through rolling pressing and bending of sheets and this typically takes place at room temperature so there's no need to heat your steel there's no need to you know melt the steel the rolling process the pressing or the bending of uh, of the sheets takes place at room temperature um, and the product that results from such uh, you know productions from such uh, cold form production uh, these are mostly purlins and these are used as uh, wool studs and I'll show you uh, an image in a second so um, in terms of sections just like you know we described for hot rolled we had various sections um, for cold formed we have two common sections and these are your Z sections now it's labeled as a Z section because it looks like a Z so the cross section view looks like a Z and again remember that we're talking about these sections going into the page a cross section uh, a C section uh, cross section is, is seen over here uh, again this is going into the page now these can be used either as posts so as vertical posts or they can be used uh, as uh, horizontal elements within a frame now station four I want to talk about the differences between hot rolled and cold formed steel Now the differences uh, would be appreciated if we analyze these two um, photos or images that we see in front of us now let, let me start off by uh, describing what we have on our left hand side so these are basically cold formed purlins that are acting as wall studs um, and that's a typical usage of cold formed steel so you use it in order to construct your framing for your walls um, i have seen it being used in order to um, you know construct big structures so we're talking about three to five stories um, but you'd normally have you know posts stronger posts so hot rolled posts um, and then the inside framing would be uh, comprised of cold formed uh, steel sections now this image on the right that's a rigid steel frame structure and you see you notice that each of these elements are thicker compared to the cold formed purlins um, they can resist higher loads and the um, the elements that we see um, in this photo they basically you've got your UB universal beams and we have our PFCs as columns so the parallel fans channels as columns over here uh, we also notice that the, these are stairs that are built or that are for, that are built yeah that are built from from steel um, 
so that's another uh, application a common application of uh, steel as a material it's used to construct these modular stairs so when I say modular stairs I mean uh, they're prefabricated in a in a factory and then they're transported to your construction site where they're installed within uh, your building okay so um, again still talking about the um, the differences between hot rolled and cold rolled steel um, if we look at cold form steel it's more effective in terms of transportation and handling um, and the reason for that is because if it's lightweight so um, it's easier to transport and handle compared to a hot rolled the production of hot rolled however is typically quicker and the reason for that is because you know you you're melting you know the steel um, and it's easier to shape and mold into your desired um, sections uh, compared to cold rolled where you have to mechanically exert forces in order to bend um, your steel sheets into desired uh, sections and shapes so um, in terms of erection and uh, installation when we're talking about you know frames um, it's faster and quicker to install cold foam steel than it is when we're dealing with hot rolled uh, steel um, and the reason for that is because when you have hot rolled steel um, the connections are more difficult so you need to get your bolts designed in a particular way such that you resist certain shear forces um, so what I mean by that is that you need to make sure that the bolting system is able to withstand um, forces such that you know your elements will remain connected together um, and plus the hot rolled steel is heavier so you typically need to consider you know um, how these are lifted and uh, for that you'd need you know to use possibly you know mobile cranes or even tower cranes um, cold form steel I've seen you know workers lift uh, full wall frames uh, without requiring any sort of um, crane to do the lifting so um, there's you know advantages and disadvantages of using each and it predominantly depends on the application so if for instance as I said if you if you've got a structure that needs to resist heavy loadings then the main uh, load bearing elements have to be um, hot rolled steel whereas if you've got you know um, interior framings um, let's say for instance your, your, your wall framing uh, that can be um, constructed from cold rolled steel okay so moving on to station five and that's probably the trickiest station uh, for this week uh, this is where I'll be briefly talking about steel design because this is an important thing uh, to understand when we're dealing with um, you know steel uh, structures so just before we move on to the details of the design process uh, let's just uh, analyze a cross section a steel frame cross section now given that it's a cross section it's basically a building that is going into the page uh, and that's you know the starting sort of the starting face of that cross section so what you see in front of you now these are your foundations and then you've got your columns and then this is the roof are uh, composed of a rafter and you have your purlins um, so these purlins again cold form steel um, so to be honest with you you know your columns and your rafters are composed of your uh, hot rolled steel whereas the purlins are made of the cold form steel now the purlins what the, their function over here is to support the roofing structure so typically 
you'd have uh, Colobon cheating, um, lying on top of these purlins. And these are used to cover uh, your roof structure. Uh, so the purlins don't necessarily need to um, resist heavy loads because typically you won't be installing any sort of equipment or machinery onto your roof and you won't have people utilizing that roof um, so we don't need you know uh, members that can resist heavy loads and hence why we use cold formed purlins in this case uh, but you know the actual structure itself right so the columns the beams the rafters they have to be um, formed from hot rolled steel and that's because we need to resist heavy loads. Um, just one point that I wanna point to, and that's your eaves strut. And these are basically um, horizontal steel sections that are added at the sides of the building. And they are, they're just used to support these cold rolled eaves beam. Um, so the ones at the very end and also support you know any purlins that are located at the very end of the structure okay um some terminology over here uh so i've been talking about you know sections and elements this is basically what an element looks like so it's just one part of the section this full you know this full um this full image is referred to as an as a section so a cross section in this case that goes into the page that's your probably your a uh, universal beam or universal column eye shaped uh, cross section this is your pfc again it, these uh this vertical member on its own is referred to or this vertical uh thing on its own is referred to as an element these horizontal ones are referred to as elements so if you combine all of them together they form your section and if you have um, if you look at the full sort of um, beam then this is what we refer to as the member and linking different members together would form your structure so in terms of the hierarchy start off with the element and various elements when you join them together you form your section and the section if you look at it as a whole is a member and different members connected together forms your overall structure some of the important steel properties to consider when you're designing steel structures first property is the fact that steel has a high strength to weight ratio Second property is the fact that it's got it's a ductile material, meaning that it does not break easily. So even when it reaches high levels of um, forces, it can still withstand these forces without breaking. Uh, it does bend, but it's really hard or very difficult to break it. An important property as well is the fact that the strength of steel is very sensitive to temperatures. So at very high temperatures, the steel behaves in a weaker fashion compared to room temperatures. And the fourth, fourth property um, to take note of is the fact that steel corrodes. So we have to find measures to avoid um, such corrosion from happening um and some of the common measure a common measure is the use of stainless steel another important thing to consider when designing steel members is the stress to strain relationship um, and it's presented via this diagram now the y-axis measures the levels of stress i.e the amount of forces exerted on a particular area on that steel member, while the x-axis measures the strain levels. And these are, and, and strain, 
strain basically represents how much um, the shape or how much how much the size of the steel member changes so in this case it's an elongation of the of the steel member as you move across the x-axis the diagram is broken up into three parts the first linear part that straight line uh, the second part is this flat line and then the third part is the curve that you see let's start off with the first part initially at point zero as you increase the step stress levels applied to your steel member the steel member elongates and that's why it's moving across the x-axis and this keeps on taking place until you reach point fy now point fy is important because it represents yield stress and it's the stress at which the material deforms permanently so beyond this point you can the shape of the material can no longer return back to its original form um, so any point before fy uh, as soon as you remove you know the loads from the steel member the steel member can return back to its original shape after point fy this can no longer take place so it deforms permanently after fy now once it reaches fy if we maintain the stress level so a fixed stress level not increasing we do still see an increase in the strain level so that the member continues to uh, extend right so there is a constant change of shape even though we're not increasing the stress levels uh, and then it reaches that point where you need to increase the stress levels in order to create additional strain up until you reach that point which is labeled as fu the ultimate tensile strength and this is a stress at which necking occurs so it's the ultimate strength it's the limit basically of your stress member of your seal member so um, that's you know the point where you know it's the maximum stress levels that can be uh, exerted on the steel member because after that you reach the point of rupture that's basically where the steel uh, breaks and in order for it to happen so once you hit a few um, once you hit the ultimate tensile strength you don't actually need to increase the stress levels in order to break your steel member it would automatically break after a certain amount of elongation that takes place uh, even though you know you know stress levels are increasing it will break and that's because it has already reached that limit strength represented by uh, the ultimate tensile strength we are now ready to design our steel structure now the design process is listed down over here um, the example that we're looking at is the one on the left hand side the uh, we just select one single panel so one single panel from our structure and we assume the same would apply for all these remaining panels now the first step in your um, design process is determining the load combinations and to do so we refer to the Australian standards AS1170 what these would describe these would uh, describe our um, the load combinations would describe our dead loads referred to as G so the notation for that is G Q is the live load and then we have wind loads that are exerted on these you know vertical steel members so any vertical loadings are usually exerted on sort of you know members in the horizontal uh plane so you know your rafters and your beams for instance would uh need to withstand dead and live loads uh vertical members on the other hand these need to withstand wind loads or earthquakes okay so we determine the load combination so suitable patterns that define our dead and live loads and our wind loads and then we move on to building uh, the analysis models so these analysis models are basically built and used by the structural engineers 
to determine impacts of the load combinations. Uh, so the impacts of these load combinations on the structure. So what kind of forces it creates in the structure? And there's three main types of forces that we're concerned with. So the first type of force, force is the axial force. These are forces that are parallel to the member. So parallel to this column. Shear forces are forces that are perpendicular to the member and they can take place at either ends of the member. So at the furthest end over here, horizontal forces and um, at the uh, end connecting to the foundation. And then we have bending moments. So these are forces that create a bending effect on our structure. So we're concerned with these three main forces and we need to make sure that any you know any of these types any of these force types that are exerted on the structure they need to be less than or equal to the design nominal capacity of our structure and that's what's represented in this equation over here so the equation basically says that on the left hand side you have your design action effect and this comes from the load combinations in this step in the first step and you know so these are the forces that are exerted on the structure these have to be less than or equal to a safety factor multiplied by the design nominal capacity of the structure so the capacity of the structure how strong the structure is um, so in other words the strength of the structure has to be greater than or equal to the actions imposed on it so um, this again this capacity factor it's a safety factor it's usually less than one and it's specified in the australian standards as a means to reduce that nominal capacity uh, even further and that's you know it's like it's acting as a safety measure it's an incentive for designers to make sure that the nominal capacity is as big as possible subject to of course you know budget constraints because you can't have you know unlimited thickness of steel that would be too expensive but you you know you choose you know your steel grade and your steel sections in a way where you ensure that the capacity of the structure after applying the safety factor will still remain larger than the um the forces so the design action applied on it so that's basically you know the process of designing the seal structure and it's important procedure because um, it links through you know the different forces exerted on the structure with the properties of you know the steel structure uh, that we're designing